Thank you, Lord, for saving me. This is that week. Give God generous praise. With your brain engaged, open your mouth and say, Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Hallelujah. Reading from the gospel written by Matthew, chapter 27, verse 38. Good. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him. The NIV translation says they hurled insults at him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him and the scribes and elders said he saved others he saved others himself he cannot save and you may be seated <clears throat> the scene is one of the most familiar in all of Christendom we're at Golgotha the place of the skull this small piece of real estate represents almost an infinitesimal percentage of the total surface of the planet Earth. It's even smaller when considered in relationship to the whole of the universe. Yet it is on this small sacred piece of ground that the redemption of the human race was accomplished through the violence and the shame of the crucifixion. It was here that Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh, reconciled the world unto himself. He did so for past, present, and future. The precious blood of Calvary covers the entire history of the human race. Calvary reaches from creation to the rapture. Sin was defeated at Calvary. Satan was conquered at Calvary. Calvary is powerful. Calvary is everlasting. Calvary is redeeming. The songwriter said it best when he wrote, Calvary covers it all. In his letter to the Hebrews, Paul reminds us that under the law and in the tabernacle, the priests routinely ministered in the outer sanctuary. But it was only once a year that the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies. He did so not without blood, and he offered a sacrifice for himself and for the errors of the people. Under the law, and while the tabernacle still existed, the way into the holiest place was not yet made available to mankind. The ceremonies were but a foreshadowing. The gifts and the sacrifices were ineffectual for the permanent forgiveness of sins. But when Christ became the high priest, he did so by the greater and more perfect tabernacle not one made with hands the gospel writer says by his own blood he entered once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us Paul said that the blood of animal sacrifices purifies the flesh but not the soul for 4,000 years, the cleansing of the soul was not possible because the perfect sacrifice had not yet been offered. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? 
How much more, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works? If under the law, the ceremonies and the rituals and the blood and the sacrifices of animals have the ability to make human beings outwardly clean according to the law, then Paul asked the absolute cogent question, how much more shall the blood of Christ who offered himself without spot purge our conscience from dead works? How much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse us from our sins. He loved us. He saved us. He washed us. Salvation is in the blood. Redemption is in the blood. Power is in the blood. Healing is in the blood. Protection is in the blood. There's power. Power. Wonder. Working power in the blood of the lamb thank God for the blood thank God for the blood thank God for the blood <laughs> glory glory Calvary is for every body all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You and I are stained with the sin of Adam. We war with this carnal nature. On your own, you cannot live a life good enough to be saved. Write yourself 10,000 volumes of rules and regulations. Live every one of them perfectly. You still cannot be saved. It is the grace of God. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us. If we're righteous, it's because Jesus made us righteous. If we're holy, it's because Jesus made us holy. If we're redeemed, it's because Jesus redeemed us. If we're saved, it's because Jesus saved us. Thank God for the blood. <laughs> Under the law, you could only be cleansed externally. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, you can be made whole internally. Pastor Williams told us on Wednesday night that you can have a clean heart and you can have a clean heart now. Your conscience can be purged. Your sordid past can be forgotten. The slate can be wiped clean. You can have a fresh start. You can have a new beginning. Your sins can be covered. Hell hasn't created a sin big enough or bad enough that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot wash it away. The saving blood of Christ can cover you. So when he looks at you, he doesn't see your shortcomings. He doesn't see your faults. He doesn't see your sins. All he sees is the precious, redeeming, powerful, forgiving blood of Jesus Christ. What? can wash away my sins. Uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, thank God for the blood. 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 Uh, God for the blood. Uh, give God generous praise in this house. Thank God for the blood. Put some energy in that gratefulness. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Glory.
There were several voices heard at Calvary that day. In addition to the physical suffering that Christ endured, he was subjected to verbal abuse as well. There was an unholy taunt that rose from the throats of the crowd as they hurled insults at him, wagged their heads. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. The voice of unbelieving repetition could be heard from the mouths of the thieves who were crucified with them as they repeated the taunts and revilings of the crowd. The voice of idle curiosity was heard from those who said, let's see whether Elias can come and save him. But our attention today will be focused on the voice that brought this accusation to his ears. He saved others. He saved others. Himself. He cannot save. This was the language of the priests and the scribes and the elders concerning Jesus as he was dying on the cross. (laughs) Judea had been filled with evidence of his Messiahship, signs of his divinity. Yet his enemies had conspired and schemed, made every effort possible to explain it all away. They used falsehoods, they used lies, they used rumors in an effort to discredit him and to diminish his growing popularity. Even though their statement of taunting was certainly not couched in terms of love or of reconciliation or even an omission of having been wrong, they had to now grudgingly admit that he had saved others. The reports had come to the temple and they had been verified. What had been said of him was true. Indeed, he had saved others. Thousands of evidence could be brought to establish this. Almost every Judean village, every Judean town could produce ample proof of this. Both the religious and the profane alike could testify. His friends and his enemies could indeed acknowledge the fact that he had saved others. He had saved from disease and wretchedness. Call Bartimaeus as a witness. He'd been blind, sitting by the wayside begging. In spite of attempts from those around him to quiet his efforts to attract the attention of Jesus, he was persistent in his petition. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. What wilt that I should do? Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then the powerful, transforming, healing words of Jesus came to him. Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight. Oh, yes, he had saved others. Call the ten lepers as witnesses. They cried, Jesus, have mercy on us. They were cleansed by this one who's now nailed to the cross. Nine of them may have failed to glorify God for their healing, but they can now readily attest to the fact that he had saved others and the church said amen. Amen. Ask the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. Spent all that she had seeking a medical cure for her illness. Nothing was better. In fact, the scripture says it was worse. Yet when she pressed through the crowd, made her way on that fateful day, touched the hem of his garment, the fountain of her blood dried up immediately. He can save others, and the church said amen. Amen. Ask the lame man who had languished by the pool of Bethesda. 
had been crippled for 38 years, yet one sentence out of the mouth of this one now suspended upon the cross had healed him. Jesus said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. 38 years of physical deformity were healed immediately. Oh yes, he had saved others. Somebody shout his name. He not only saved from death or destruction and disease, but he saved from death as well. Ask the son of the widow of name what it feels like to be a corpse in a funeral possession and then to live again. Ask Lazarus what it feels like to have been dead for four days, to have the stink of decaying flesh emanate from your body. Can you describe Lazarus what it feels like to have death return to life, to have your consciousness restored, to have your decaying flesh miraculously uh, regenerated? Do you have the words, Lazarus, to tell us what kind of experience it is? to awaken in a tomb, find yourself wrapped in grave clothes, all because there were three words from the mouth of this man who's now nailed to the cross. He said, Lazarus, come forth. All power in heaven and earth is given unto him. This Jesus has power over death itself. Indeed, he can save others. So the first half of their declaration was right. He has saved others. He can save others. He did save others. Not only did he save from disease and death, he saved from sins as well. Ask the man who was born blind and received both the restoration of his sight and the forgiveness of his sins. Ask Zacchaeus, what it's like to be a crooked, embezzling, extorting tax collector one day, and then the next day, have your life so rearranged, to have your values so completely reversed by an encounter with one day with this man called Jesus that you give by a back by a factor of four everything you've stolen from innocent people. He can save others. And if none of those people is available, ask the dying thief who's on the cross crucified next to him only hours away from death in eternity. Ask him what it feels like to have God incarnate say, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Oh, he can save others. Is there a witness in the house today who from personal experience can say that Jesus can save others? Uh, is there somebody who will testify that he's healed your body? that he's released you from your addiction, that he's forgiven your sins, that he saved your soul. Is there somebody in the house who was blind? Now you see you're a sinner. Now you're saved. You are lost and now you're found. Is there somebody who can say, I'm not what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be because Jesus touched me. Jesus saved me. Jesus changed me. He can save others. Give affirmation to the word of the Lord. His hecklers admitted the incontestable fact that he could save others. Yet the hardness of their hearts triumphed and they added these words, himself, he cannot save. What they uttered in wicked irony was full of important truth. 
they unwittingly confirmed and affirmed the very essence of the gospel. He is divine, yet himself he cannot save. The world was made with him, and without him was not anything made, yet himself he cannot save. He sustaineth all things by the power of his word, yet himself he cannot save. Devils were subjected to his power, yet himself he cannot save. Was his inability to save himself the result of weakness? <laughs> Was it a lack of spiritual or physical power? No, a thousand times no. All power in heaven and earth is given unto him. Legions of angels were subject to his command. They would have rushed to his aid in an instant. One spoken word out of the Almighty could have paralyzed every hand raised against him. He was not a helpless victim of circumstances. He was in charge of the events at hand. He declared, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down myself. <laughs> Momentous truth was ignorantly expressed in their words that he could save others but not himself. In the literal sense, the statement is absolutely false. He obviously could have saved himself. Jesus was not destitute of physical power to release himself from their schemes and from their punishment. Yet in the theological sense, the statement is true because there was and there is a divine necessity for the cross. Had he saved himself, the gracious purposes of God would have been frustrated. The predictions of the prophets would have been falsified. The types and shadows under the law would have been stamped with insignificance. His life, his sojourn on this earth would have been rendered void and insignificant. Bethlehem would have been meaningless. This world would have been unredeemed forever had he saved himself. Had he saved himself, you and I would not be sitting here in this sanctuary on this Palm Sunday morning. Oh, we would be lost. We would be undone. We would be without God. But because he chose to not save himself, because he refused to save himself, we've been redeemed. We've been saved. We've been sanctified. We've been justified. We've been made heirs of God. Join heirs with Jesus Christ. We are adopted sons of God because he would not save himself. Indeed, had he saved himself, he could not have saved others. He did not save himself so that others through his death might be saved. These men needed only alter one word in their statement to have been grandly and gloriously correct. Instead of saying himself, he cannot save. They should have said himself, he will, he will not save. save. Had they said that, they would have grasped the very heart of his power. They would have tapped into the center of the glory and brightness of Christ. Had they said himself, he will not save, they would have spoken eternal truth out of their carnal mouths. He will not save himself because he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He will not save himself because he has undertaken the redemption of mankind. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Therefore, if others were to be saved, then Christ could not save himself. If others were to live, then Christ had to die. 
It was his will that nailed him to the cross. He fixed himself the chains that bound him. He set the parameters. He set the rules. He set the guidelines. It was his divine justice that had to be met. He would not obstruct his own divine purpose. His love for us. And this is where we all get lost. Because we just can't fathom it. But his love for us made it impossible for him to relinquish the task set before him. No eternal power bound him to that cross. It wasn't the high priest. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't Herod. It wasn't Roman soldiers. It wasn't even nails that held him to that cross. He was bound there by cords of love. Unexplainable. Incomprehensible matchless love he loved you he loved me not because we deserve to be loved not because we did something to deserve his favor but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us Our salvation is expensive. It costs a lot. It's full of irony and paradox. He could not exalt us without being debased himself. He not, could not procure our justification without being condemned himself. He could not feed us without giving his body to be the bread of life. He couldn't deliver us from the curse of sin without being made a curse for us. He took our sins, bore them on the tree. Preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. What I'm saying today to the non-religious ear makes no sense. Tell somebody who knows nothing about God that 2,000 years ago, God wrapped himself in flesh, came to this earth, offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for their sins. They have no idea. They can't even think about that. So the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved. But to us which are saved, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. Thank God for the blood. 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 You can get lost in theology and religion. You can get entangled in original Greek and Hebrew. I say this morning, we need to just start with the basics. Number one, I am a sinner and Jesus loves me. Number two, because I am a sinner, I need a savior and Jesus died for me. I stand with the apostle Paul and declare, for I am determined not to know anything among you save Christ and him crucified himself he cannot save himself he cannot save